there's a good chance that if you're not using the forgiveness filter, absolutely everything that you're reading in the Bible is being interpreted incorrectly. Unfortunately, words transform in their meaning and usage over time. And so what happens is that they get filtered through the various ways that the word transforms in meaning that when you have something that is written it can change its meaning simply because the word that you're reading doesn't mean what it meant when it was written there and unfortunately the forgiveness filter is something that needed to be developed in order to counteract the effect of the filter the tyranny filter that the entirety of the text of the Bible has been filtered through. Because every bit of it has been filtered through the concept of tyranny. So words like commandment, instead of simply meaning an instruction or a principle, end up being a demand under threat of punishment. Because tyranny filters it that way. God is not a tyrant. Jesus showed that the principle of God is to rule by serving, not by lording over others. When you filter every single concept through a concept of tyranny, then things like obedience, instead of being listening to an instruction and following those instructions for your own benefit, become being given a demand under threat of punishment and you shut up and you do what you're told or face the punishment. And over and over again, there are two main filters that most mainstream religion has filtered the Bible through. One is the lens of tyranny, and the other is that of law. So a word, for example, like justified, if you were to ask a typical person who understands the concept of justification, will probably offer a legal-based definition of the term. That it means to be declared innocent, as though one were in a court of law before God, being accused by God, which would therefore make God the devil, because that's what accuser is, is the devil. So if God is your great cosmic accuser, and you need to be declared innocent, then that would be the meaning of justification. But God is not your accuser, and you do not stand in front of a courtroom, in front of him, where he demands that you present the reason why you should be found acceptable in his sight. I suggest, rather, that if there is any such concept that you die and stand before God, what instead he does is says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased that what it is, is an introduction in which you are introduced to everybody else as being beloved and a son or daughter. And there is absolutely zero passages in the entirety of the Bible that would suggest that the fiction that you stand before God accused or attempting in, in need of making yourself presentable and acceptable to God. It's not there. We can't turn to the passage where, in the book of Acts, this scenario is presented. We cannot turn to anywhere in the New Testament where anybody ever said, do you know where you would go if you were to die tonight? So, the point is, that very many of the concepts that are inserted into religion are inserted through a lens of tyranny and legalism, both of which are wrong, both of which do not reflect the nature and character of God. And so, with that in mind, almost every word that you read in the Bible needs to be properly defined. It needs to be defined through the lens of forgiveness. It needs to be defined through the lens of ruling by serving. It needs to be defined 
through the lens of love keeps no records of wrongs and does no harm. And so when that happens, pretty much every word and every concept that religion teaches you is wrong because it's filtering it through the wrong lens. And so today we're going to look at the continuation of the violent conflict that Jesus had with the religious establishment, which was doing very much the same thing at that time filtering it through a wrong lens. So one of the tools that Jesus used was to teach uh, that all outcomes are equal. With the parable of the late laborers, which is, I think, one of the most important passages in the entirety of the Bible, is that it teaches a lesson that the outcome at the end is the same regardless of performance. It is the absolute enemy of a performance-based value system because it says everybody was valued the same and well not just the same poorly as religion might give you a doctrine of total depravity that says yes everyone is equal because they're all equally disgusting they're all equally sinful they're all equally worthless they're all equally depraved no this says they are all equally well esteemed and that is the blasphemy that religion cannot stand, is that the outcome is equally of benefit, regardless of performance. So, the religious establishment hates this. They value by performance. And so, this takes us to the concept of what a hypocrite is. And a hypocrite is a person who makes a pretense or facade for the purpose of being esteemed with prestige. And it's a false righteousness, a religious righteousness of religious works and religious traditions. And we kind of have changed this word in its meaning to mean that if you expect people to behave in a certain way that you yourself do not behave, or if you advise even, it gets it really gets to me when it's simply advice like, okay, you're smoking two packs of cigarettes a day through a hole in your throat and advising people don't start smoking. Like, that's not hypocrisy. That's good advice from somebody who understands just how much of an enslavement it is to get involved in that. That's not a hypocrite. That's someone giving you good advice. But... Nevertheless, we're going to take a look at what it actually is, how it's actually used in the Bible. And we run it through and see what it says and see that it has to do with esteeming a public perception of prestige and of maintaining religious works above acts of kindness and compassion. I think that the best definition or summarization of what hypocrisy is about can be found in the book of James. And we look in James chapter 3, and we start at verse 8, and it says, But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. And so here we see James is putting forth the idea that if man is made in the likeness and image of God, then you can't possibly bless God and curse men made after the likeness and image of God. It's, that in itself is contrary. But then he proceeds further and says, if you've got the same source, the same mouth, the same heart, the same mind, the same principles that you're propo proposing then you shouldn't have, on one hand, cursing people, and on the other hand, praising God. And this is exactly what hypocrisy is. It's to not see a value based on being in the likeness and image of God, but rather seeing a value based on religious performance. And so, you bless God and curse men. So he continues the illustration of 
out of the same source shouldn't be good and evil, shouldn't be blessing and cursing. He says, does a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descends not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. So this passage can tell you as a test whether something is the wisdom of God or not. Because if it, is, if it encourages envying, if it encourages strife, if it creates confusion, then that is not the wisdom from God. Because the wisdom of God is peaceable and gentle. It is easy to be entreated. It's full of mercy. It's without partiality. And it's without hypocrisy. Well, what was hypocrisy? To bless God and curse men. It is without esteeming religious works above acts of kindness and compassion. So we want to take a look at the use of hypocrisy throughout the text, and especially the attacks that Jesus uh, had some monologues there of woe to you hypocrites. And what kind of things we'll see that it was religious works and the desire to be seen and highly esteemed that were driving these people and that what they weren't doing was taking care of people. They weren't taking care of, they were not following the principle of love one another. They were following the principle of be a good religious uh, practitioner. And that is unfortunately very much what we see today in religion is be a good practitioner and not so much love one another. And Jesus' message was very much about taking care of the needy and love for one another. And that's been distorted. So when we think of the word hypocrite, it's a compound word and the first, the H-Y-P-O is the same as like a hypodermic needle where it means it goes under the dermis, under the, under the layer of skin. So the hypo means under. And hypothermia means that your body temperature is under the temperature that it's supposed to be. So a hypocrite is under something. And what they're under is crisis. So a hypocrite is under crisis. And crisis is what we saw when we looked at the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost in Mark 3, 28 and 29. And it talked about the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost where they were accusing Jesus of healing by the power of the devil. And so what Jesus said was, don't assign the power of God, which is healing, to the devil. And he said, if you do that, you're going to have a problem. So this, has been, this verse has been distorted as well as what it means. Because... One thing is that it's not God who's doing the not forgiving in this. When he says, Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness. It's not God not forgiving, but is in danger of, of eternal damnation. Notice also that it's in danger of, which means that there is an escape to it. The escape to it is to stop assigning the power of God to the devil. That would be the escape from it. But as long as you continue to assign the power of healing as something that the devil can do, you are stuck in a loop of wondering whether a healing that you witness might be the power of the devil in order to trick you out of the doctrine that you are believing in. And so your doctrine is always being threatened by a false healing, by a false deity. And once, when that's your situation you're in danger of eternal damnation now damnation is rooted from the same word 
in the in the Greek text as the word hypocrite derives from, because the word hypocrite is derived of, from Greek, and so the word that's translated as damnation here in this passage is the word crisis. And so a hypocrite is under crisis. It's a person who is always under damnation, we could say. So now we need to understand better what damnation is, because it's not eternal conscious torment after you die. That's inserted into the text. That's something that's not actually there, just like it's not there that God is the one doing the not forgiving. It is not there that damnation means eternal conscious torment after you die. What is damnation? Damnation is to blame, injure, invalidate, attack, find guilty, there's your legal terminology, blame, or account unworthy. That's, an, that's a great one there. Account unworthy is what damnation is. It is to invalidate and account unworthy. It is to blame. It is to find guilty. So, what is going to happen if you're committing this blasphemy of the Holy Ghost? You see something good. And you decide that it's not from God because it's not from somebody. It's not passing through an avenue of someone professing your doctrine. Someone who doesn't practice your religion the way that you practice. So this must be a trick of the devil. When you think everything is a trick of the devil, then you have to be suspicious of everything all the time. And you can't just praise God, oh, thank God this person is healed. You say, uh-oh, I don't think this, this healing came from God. This is a trick of the devil trying to lead me astray from my doctrine. If that's the case, you're always going to be in a loop. You're going to be stuck in internal eternal damnation because you're going to be stuck always questioning whether it's the god it's god or the devil who's doing something when all good gifts come from god all good gifts come from god so the eternal here is not a reference to the fact that it is without end it is that is without perceivable end so as long as you're stuck in this loop of having this mentality, you will be stuck in this loop of being in eternal crisis, of always wondering, I wonder if this might be a trick of the devil. I wonder if this might be a trick of the devil. I wonder if this might be a trick of the devil. I better hold on to my doctrine because the devil's trying to trick me. He's, he's counterfeiting God and doing the things that God does. No, you're taking the power of God and assigning it to the devil, and that is the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. And as long as you continue to do that, you cannot know liberty, you cannot know forgiveness, you cannot know emancipation. The only thing that you can know is a perpetual state of crisis, a perpetual state of being invalidated, being found guilty yourself blaming yourself and others for things and finding yourself to be unworthy. I find it interesting that in Acts 13.46 we read, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Why are they unworthy of eternal life? Because they are under crisis. They are under damnation. They are under counting themselves unworthy. They are hypocrites. That's what it is. So now we're going to finally get into passages involving Jesus. And we go to the book of Mark chapter 7. And it says, Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes, which came from Jerusalem, and when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say with unwashed hands, they found fault. So I just want to pause right here and say that while we have this concept of hygienic hand washing before eating, what is being referenced here has nothing to do with hygiene and perhaps was even unhygienic because they had standing water and they performed a religious ritual of hand washing. They performed a religious ritual of washing uh, of cups and plates and so forth. And it really wasn't about hygiene at all. It was about the fact that what they were doing was a religious ritual that it, it would be like um, taking something and, and when you perform a ritual, then it's okay. But before you perform that ritual, it's not okay. So this is the kind of ritual that they had when it came to eating was that they, they did this religious ritual of washing hands in the same filthy, disgusting water that the person before them and the person after them washed their hands in. Um, it wasn't hygienic. 
it really wasn't. Um, and so the issue is one of a religious ritual and not one of hygiene. They're not going, ew, that's gross, you're spreading germs. They're saying, you are not eating something that is approved of God because you have not performed the right religious rites in order to make it approve of God. So, for the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be which they have received to hold, as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels, and of tables. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tra tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? Again, not in a hygienic sense, but in a ritual sense. He answered and said unto them, Well has Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, and is, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandments of God, that ye may keep your own tradition." For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curses father or mother, let him die the death. But you say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, It is Corbin, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou might be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such things do ye. So, we see here that he's talking about people that are esteeming a religious tradition, the commandments of men, the traditions of men above the word of God. And he gives an illustration of a person who, instead of honoring mother and father, says, hey, anything that I do for you, you ought to count it as a blessing that I'm doing anything for you. So, in other words, flipping it around and saying, I'm the one who should be getting honored here, not you. So it's backwards. It makes the word of God of none effect through their tradition. And so what happens is that they're more obsessed with the religious ritual and the religious traditions than they are for what the heart of God is in even giving. As I, as I mentioned before, we look at this and we even see commandment and we think demand under threat of punishment and very much so, that's what the law of Moses was, which was why it needed to be put down. It needed to be euthanized. It needed to be taken out. Um, but commandment can just simply be an instruction or a principle. So if you give a commandment of love one another, are you demanding it or are you instructing it? Are you saying, make this your principle? Those are two entirely different concepts, but both of them are consistent with what the word command means. It's just that one is filtered through the lens of tyranny, and the other is filtered through the lens of fathership. You can see that there's a difference. This is why Jesus spoke of God the Father. He's set, and unfortunately, we've twisted this around even and turned fathers into tyrants, rather than understanding the illustration of ruling by serving. And so an instruction is supposed to be for your well-being, not under the threat of punishment, but under threat of it's just not going to work well for you if you don't follow the instructions. That's just how it is. Um, you know, you try baking a cake and don't follow the instructions, your mileage may vary as to whether it's even edible. There's no punishment for failing to follow the instructions, which would be to obey or disobey. You know, being disobedient to the instructions of baking a cake, you know, that the, 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 <laughs> the outcome is its own punishment because what you have is a wasted and inedible cake. And that's the difference when you filter through tyranny versus when you, whether you filter through love, whether you filter through forgiveness, whether you filter through ruling by serving, whether you filter through the principles that Jesus actually professed or whether you filter through the tyranny of man. So now we go to Matthew chapter 6, and we see a few more illustrations where we'll see 
that it's about religious ritual and being seen before people to be esteemed by people. And so we look in Matthew chapter 6, it says, and, and I'm just going to go through the parts here that, co that cover what the hypocrites do. Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. So there it is. It's a religious ritual, doing your alms and doing it before men to be seen. That's the important thing. So then we go to verse 5, and it says, And when thou prayest, you shall not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corner of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. So again, it's a religious performance for the purpose of being seen. It's making a show. Um, and that's another one of the roots of what the word hypocrite is, is to make a show or be an actor. Um, so that's really what they're doing. They're putting on a stage show. Look how righteous I am. You can see how I make this prayer. Is this not a wonderful prayer? I thank God that I am not like this filthy, disgusting sinner here. I thank God that I am not a woman. I thank God that I am one of the blessed children of God. Hallelujah. God is good to me. And... So that's what he's saying. They have their reward. They're they're putting on their stage show and being seen and they're impressing the people that they're impressing. But they're not impressing anything as it pertains to acts of kindness and compassion. They are not helping the fatherless and the widows. They are not feeding the hungry. They are not clothing the naked. They are not helping the needy. They are not comforting the grieving. That's what the message of the gospel was supposed to be about not a, a religious performance to appear righteous unto others by religious ritual, by religious standards. Verse 16, Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. There it is again, doing a religious performance and putting on a show about it. I'm going to disfigure my face. There's a passage in Isaiah, and I don't remember which chapter, but it's, it talks about fasting. And it talks about what a ridiculous demonstration of public display that they put on to make sure everybody knows that they're fasting. To make sure, and he says, you know, if you're going to fast, you should take the food that you were going to eat and give it to somebody that needs it. And other than that, do whatever you do. But don't make a public demonstration of it. You look like an idiot. Um, I wish I had prepared that. Um, but at any rate, the point was that they wanted to make an appearance of righteousness. Oh, look at me. I'm so, I'm so pious with my fasting. And so they want to make sure everybody knows that they're fasting. And that's what a hypocrite does. And so then we go to Matthew chapter 23. And it says, then, Je then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do ye not after their works, for they say and do not. And so this is what we typically think of hypocrisy as being, is that they say and do not. It's do as I say, not as I do. But note here that Jesus says, whatever, whatever they bid you, observe, that observe and do. So if you got the guy smoking the two packs of cigarettes through the hole in his, hole in his throat saying, don't smoke, he's giving you good advice. That's what it's saying. It's saying, don't do what he does, do what he says. It's saying, in fact, follow his advice. Yes, do that. Um, so the the proper response would not be to turn around and say, who are you to tell me what to do? Well, the person giving you good advice. There it is. It's right there. It's even in the text. In the same passage that we draw our erroneous conclusion of what a hypocrite is, it's right there. Do what they tell you. Um, so, at any rate. that's That would be advice. That would be an instruction, not a demand under threat of punishment. Um, not filtered through the lens of tyranny. But it says... Uh, do not after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. And so this is 
they have like passages from the from the Torah and they're on their garments and so they're, they're making a public display of just how religious they are basically and it said and this is done to be seen of men is again it's religious works in order to have a position of prestige and to be esteemed with a false religious righteousness that has nothing to do with having acts of kindness and compassion or helping the needy and so it says, And they love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. So there it is. There's your prestige. There's your high esteem. They want to be, they want to be the, the person who's held up above others as being more worthy than anybody else because their performance is more worthy than everybody else. And he says, but be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. Well, there's a there's a po point to pause and think for a moment. Uh, you know, you are all brothers. You are all part of the same family. So what is he saying? He's saying that your value is equal in spite of your performance. So he's saying don't call somebody your master because you're all equal. That's really what he's getting at is is you know that they're all brothers so they are all equal and call no man your father upon the earth for one is your father which is in heaven neither be called masters for one is your master even christ but he that is greatest among you shall be your servant so there's the uh ruling by serving principle right there and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased and he that shall humble humble himself shall be exalted so there it is, that's tied together, the rule by serving tied together with attacking the theology of reversal. Because I like to say that I'm going to be the most lazy, apathetic, complacent, unhelpful, useless person possible so that when the last shall be first and the first shall be last, I'll be running everything, baby. Yeah. All right. Or maybe that's not what it means that the last shall be first. Maybe it actually means they're the same thing. And that's what he's doing. Again, attacking the theology of reversal that they had where the oppressor was going to become the one that has the foot on their throat instead of just everything works out equal so now it says but woe unto you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men for ye neither go in yourselves neither suffer them that are entering to go in Woe unto you, scribes and pharisees hypocrites for ye devour widows houses and for a pretense make long prayer Therefore shall you receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. So again, here's religious works. They make long prayer as a pretense. That's They put on a good show of, of how they make their big public prayers. But what they do when it comes to caring for widows, well, no, they, they take the houses, kick the widows out, say good luck you're on your own so they're not doing what the law prescribed which was that you care for widows but what they are doing is making a big show of their religion and how religious they are with their pretenses and their long prayers made in public so that everybody can see to be seen of men and it says that they make proselytes so they get people converting to their religion but what are they doing? They're they're making a convert to their religion, but the convert is not helping people. The convert does not practice love for one another. The convert does not practice helping the needy. The convert isn't doing anything any good to anybody except being another person practicing the same religion. Good for you. Way to go. Awesome. Must be very proud of yourselves. Let's go to verse 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. So there it is again. They pay their tithe, but when it comes to having judgment, which is actually, uh, there's, I can't even remember it off the top of my head, but... But perfect judgment is to care for the fatherless and the widow and the needy and to have mercy and to have faith, to, to have faith in other people, to have faith for one another. That's way underplayed as what faith means, to have faith in each other and to have mercy. And so this is about having compassion for people. This is about sharing in 
in the fact that they're every bit as valuable as as you are and if their estate is lesser than yours and you have the ability to help them that's what you're supposed to be doing is helping them but no we're going to make a public demonstration of paying a tithe of which we have so much left over and yet you know it's like the the woman who threw in the only coin that she had and she was willing to give up everything she had, even though it was almost nothing. And this other guy's boasting about how much he's giving when he's got plenty left over to that he could have given more, or you know, at least not tried to make a public performance of it, at the very least. You blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup of the pl and the platter, but within are full of extortion and excess. Now he's really getting to the getting to the attack phase here, where he says, while it looks good on the outside, what's inside is disgusting. And so this is what he's really getting to, is when this is your mindset, when your framework is to put religious works and being esteemed highly and having that position of prestige above helping people and above love for one another and above compassion and above uh, helping the needy, then what you are is you look good on the outside, but inside you're disgusting. And so over and over again, he's going to hit on the premise that you look good on the outside inside you're disgusting and what the reason for that is is because religious works have been elevated above acts of kindness and compassion woe unto you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for you are like unto whited sepulchres which indeed appear beautiful outward but are within full of dead man's bones and all uncleanness so there's a there's a grave and it looks pretty on the outside, but inside it's full of rotting f corpses and maggots and other disgusting things. It's completely gross inside. And that's what he's saying. These, these people are like a grave that's pretty on the outside and rotting corpses on the inside. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. So what is hypocrisy? To praise God and curse men. And iniquity is to judge value based on performance. And so since performances are unequal, then value is unequal. This is why the late laborers protested that they got paid the same as those who did no labor. Because unequal performance should be unequal pay. And the parable of the late laborers shows that the outcome is equal. God treats everybody equally well. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. And say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, you be witnesses unto yourselves that you are the children of them that killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? And so, first of all, let's just stop there. The damnation of hell... Who's he threatening with that? Who's he, who's he even talking about? He's talking about religious people. People that are extremely devoted to religious works. But what are they, forget, what are they failing to do? What they are failing to do is to take care of people. They are failing to live by love for one another. So that is what a hypocrite is is that it is somebody who values their religious works above acts of kindness and compassion. <clears throat>